Today's speaker, his name is Dr. Jason Baer. Uh, he received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Washington in Seattle in 2002. Currently teaches at Loyola Marymount University in the Department of Philosophy. He's written a book called The Inquiring Mind on Intellectual Virtues and Virtue Epistemology, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2011. He edited another volume called Intellectual Virtues and Education, Essays in Applied Virtue Epistemology, published by Routledge in 2016. So what this means is he's one of these philosophers who's, who's not just up in the clouds in, in Plato's forms, but tries to show how something like Plato's educational system or something different than that might look in real life. Uh, in fact, as part of that project, he founded the Intellectual Virtues and Education Project, and he helped to found the Intellectual Virtues Academy in Long Beach. So he is trying to take his research in philosophy and make it real for people like you. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Baer. Well, I want to begin by thanking David and others here who arranged for me to come and speak with you today. And I want to thank all of you who are here, students. Um, I know what demands are on your time, and, and though I know some of you were required to be here, I'm still grateful for um, your presence. Now, I have to say up front that one of the main things I want to talk to you about might feel kind of like a downer. Um, what I hope to kind of highlight for us is what I would consider to be one of the more significant social and um, political, intellectual problems um, of our time. So I want to spend some time taking it seriously. Um, though it might feel like kind of a downer, there's sometimes something to be said for being honest about problems that are confronting us. And, uh, and so I hope you find some value in that. And then towards the end of my talk, but I understand a number of you have to leave at 11, so you, you might miss this part, but toward the end of my talk, I'd like to point in the direction um, not of a solution to the problem, but of uh, a way of framing a partial solution to the problem. So again, thank you for being here. The problem that I'd like to uh, begin by uh, discussing is what I would refer to as a crisis of epistemic trust. Now, epistemic, as you may know, means it pertaining to knowledge, to evidence, to truth. So what I want to try to unpack for you and illustrate for you is what I will refer to as a crisis of epistemic trust. And I'm going to begin with an example that appeared in the Washington Post less than a week ago. And you may have read this or you may have read the story that it's about, um, but the, the story itself that you see the headline for was written by a Washington Post reporter about how he apparently got duped into um, believing a certain item of fake news. And the, the, that item of fake news it involved a s sort of spectacular, nearly crash landing of a plane um, in, in China. And, and, and this reporter ran across the article in his social media news feed and for at least some period of time apparently thought that it was real. What was striking to me when reading this was, was that if a Washington Post technology reporter is getting duped by fake news, then what do the rest of us, what chance do the rest of us stand to not also be getting suckered or duped into believing fake news? So I thought what I would try to do is spell out for you kind of the, the, the problem that this story illustrates in just a little bit more detail. Step number one, we get most of our information about the world from other sources, not from our first-hand observation, right? We're constantly drawing on information from other sources beyond ourselves. And today, our access to these sources is typically mediated by technology. Technology 
gives us our information about the world. The problem is that advances in technology make it very difficult for us to reliably access accurate information. Innovations, advances in technology, which are supposed to be good things, and in many respects are, actually make it more difficult for us to reliably access, knowingly access, accurate information about the world. And so, many of us who are paying attention and are honest with ourselves are left with the question, whom can we trust for our information about the world? We have an important election coming up here, as you know, and, and so you may be paying more attention to politics or to things going on in the world than usual in light of that, but if you're like me, you might feel confused about who to believe, who to trust, how to vote. And I think a lot of that confusion comes from a kind of mistrust in the sources of information that we are confronted with on a day-to-day -day basis. So whom can we trust for our information about the world? That's a hard, pressing question that I suspect um, many of you here feel. To try to explore and develop and illustrate this problem in a little bit more detail, I'm going to um, dive a little bit deeper into three points or three phenomena that illustrate the third of those three statements there. The first has to do with the sheer proliferation of fake news, the pervasiveness of fake news in the informational landscape in which we live our lives. Um, in a recent uh, article in The Atlantic that was reporting on a major study at MIT that focused mainly on, on, on the usage of Twitter, the author said the following, by every common metric, falsehood consistently dominates the truth it wins out on Twitter. Fake news and false rumors reach more people, penetrate deeper into the social network, and spread much faster than accurate stories. A false story is much more likely to go viral than a real story. A false story reaches 1,500 people six times quicker on average than a true story does. And while false stories outperform the truth on every subject, including business, terrorism and war, science, technology, entertainment, fake news about politics regularly does best. Twitter users seem almost to prefer sharing falsehoods, even when the researchers controlled for every difference between the accounts originating rumors falsehoods were still 70% more likely to get retweeted than accurate news. That's frightening. To the extent that we care about the truth, to the extent that we want to be genuinely informed about things like terrorism, business, war, science, technology, entertainment, politics, it's frightening to think about how pervasive fake news is. The second item that I want to highlight for you is the sheer sophistication of some of the misinformation and fake news that's out there, the technological sophistication. What you see an image of there is from the, what's called the Synthesizing Obama uh, Project at the University of Washington, where researchers are developing um, technology software that will allow the user to take an audio recording and some video footage of a person and to manipulate the video footage so that the person is saying whatever was in the audio recording. You, you may be, this, this may be old news to you. Um, but it's also a little bit frightening because it's the power to provide video evidence of anybody saying anything. 
And of course, the, the flip side of that is that the existence of this technology can also provide someone with grounds for doubting any video evidence that they see of someone saying something, right? Because they can say, oh, they, that was probably just manipulated. So if you want to get video evidence of, saying, of somebody saying something, you've got the means to do it. And if you want to doubt video evidence of someone saying something, you've got the grounds for doing so. So here's just a description um, from an article from The Guardian um, concerning this technology. There's a new breed of video and audio manipulation tools made possible by advances in artificial intelligence and computer graphics that will allow for the creation of realistic footage of public figures appearing to say, well, anything. This is the future of fake news. We, we've long been told not to believe everything we read, but soon we'll have to question everything we see and hear as well. Now, a third illustration of how it's hard for us to reliably access accurate information about the world concerns a way in which um, the technology that we use to get our information about the world kind of perpetuates the problem of fake news. And this is what I would refer to as the problem of epistemic insularity. Again, epistemic referring to knowing and knowledge. So 62% of American adults and nearly two-thirds of Facebook users get their news from their social media feeds. So that's where we're getting our information um, about the world, about politics, about science. Social media algorithm, algorithms, as you probably know, supply users with content that aligns with their pre-existing views. So if I read a lot of articles that, that take a certain political perspective, I'm going to be fed more information in my social media feed that reflects that political point of view. And then the problem just compounds. And over time, then, what ends up happening is that each of us ends up existing and consuming information and forming our picture of reality from within our own echo chambers or information cocoons. So again, <clears throat> I hope you can appreciate the question, how can we reliably access information about the world? Whom can we trust to provide us with that information? It's a difficult question. And lest you think that, that, that it's a trivial question, I want to highlight as well some of what's at stake. Why this is an important question and one that we should be concerned about and, and take seriously as individuals, as universities, as a society. So first of all, truth is in the balance. If you care about truth, if you care about having an, an accurate, truthful understanding of your world, and again, of history, or of science, or of politics, if you care about truth, then the, the information or epistemic situation that we find ourselves in, that we've just looked at, um, can feel a little bit discouraging or frightening. And a concern with truth isn't just for philosophers and other academics. I think most of us feel that part of what it is to have a good life is to not be duped or deeply deceived about important questions or important issues in life. Most of us think that part of what it is to flourish and to live a good life is to not be duped and deceived in these ways. So truth hangs in the balance. Democracy also hangs in the balance, and there are at least a couple of different ways in, that I'd like to highlight and, and a couple of ways in which this is true. First of all, as you all know, we, uh, to have a healthy democracy, citizens need to be active. 
We need to be discussing, we need to be debating, we need to be voting. But our confidence in those activities will be proportional to the confidence that we can have in our political beliefs and in the quality of information that we're getting about politics. So to the extent that like, you feel like you can't trust any sources that report on politics, how is that going to affect your democratic participation? Probably going to leave you feeling apathetic. And then who does that leave your democracy to? Where does the power reside? When those of you who are trying to be honest about your intellectual situation don't have the confidence to be active or to vote. Well, it leaves the power in the people that are uh, most certain of what they believe, regardless of what the evidence is. It leaves the power with the most radical, dogmatic individuals. And that's a problem for democracy. Furthermore, in order for a democracy to flourish, we need a healthy and vibrant, vibrant public discourse. We need to be able to argue with each other. We don't have to disagree, but we need to be able to debate and to argue. But we need the conditions for, for arguing and debating to be healthy and to be positive and not to be polluted. But if the informational landscape is polluted with fake news and false information or questionable information, that will significantly undermine the quality of public debate and public discourse. Here's a, here's a, it's it's a little bit um, elevated in the language, but it's a very um, appropriate and, and timely quote from the 19th century British philosopher, John Stuart Mill, about the importance of truth in public debate. So try to, try to stick with me here. It's not enough, he says, that each person should hear the arguments of adversaries from his own teachers, presented as they state them. He must be able to hear them. This is, each of us must be able to hear the viewpoints of people that we disagree with. He must be able to hear them from persons who actually believe those views, who defend those views, views that we disagree with, who defend those views in earnest and do their very utmost for them. He must know them in their most plausible and persuasive form. He must feel the whole force of the difficulty which the true view of the subject has to encounter and dispose of, else he will never really possess himself of the portion of truth which meets and removes that difficulty. Here's what he's saying. saying, If you and I want to have honest, truthful views about politics, say, It's not enough to learn about alternative views by just looking at or going to um, sources or individuals that already agree with us. We need to give serious consideration to the best, most compelling versions of the viewpoints that we disagree with. And of course, people who believe differently than us need to do the same about their representations of the things we believe. This kind of public discourse can't happen when the informational landscape is flooded with fake news and bad information, misinformation. And if good democracy, healthy democracy, depends on healthy public discourse, then again, we have a problem. Is that enough bad news for you? Okay, well, what about a solution? Notice there's a question mark after solution because I'm, as I indicated, I'm not about to try to 
give you some grand solution. There's no simple solution. There's no silver bullet. I do think that any adequate attempt at a solution will need to operate along a couple of different dimensions. One would be a more social or systemic dimension. And one would be an individual dimension. I want to focus primarily on the individual dimension here, but I'll begin just by acknowledging, because this is critical, that any adequate attempt to improve the situation we've just described has to involve changes on the part of news organizations and social media companies. And, and many of them are, are undertaking good, honest efforts at reform in this respect. So corporately, we need improved content modera moderation by news organizations and social media companies. More resources, more vetting of information, uh, better algorithms so that we don't run into the problem of epistemic insularity that I mentioned. So, so part of the solution certainly is broad and, and corporate. But since most of us don't yet, at least, have a lot of control over what these organizations and corporations do, what I'd like to focus on more is what can we as individuals do to stop participating in some of the problems that we've looked at. And of course, there are lots of different things we can do. You could quit Twitter, you could quit Facebook. Um, that would be one thing, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to argue for that here. Instead, what I'll suggest is, it's somewhat obvious, but I want to try to unpack it a bit for you, is that we must no longer be passive. We must not be passive and thoughtless in our consumption of information. So when you're looking at news in your social, in your social media feeds, I hope you can see, like, this is important stuff that I'm paying attention to. It affects my relationship to truth. It affects my participation as a democratic citizen. It affects the quality of the democracy that I live in. So we mustn't be passive or thoughtless in our consumption of information. Rather, we must be vigilant and discriminating. What can we do to be more vigilant and discriminating in our consumption of information? Again, I suggest that it would be helpful to have some language, some, some, some concrete terms and concepts that could help flesh out what that might look like for us. And that's precisely where I think the idea of intellectual character and intellectual virtues is especially useful. So this is an idea that I want to just try to illustrate and um, unpack for you a little bit. Intellectual virtues, as I'm thinking about them, are the character strengths. They're the character strengths of a good thinker or a good learner or a good information gatherer. They would include qualities like curiosity, attentiveness, open-mindedness, and intellectual autonomy, humility, carefulness, thoroughness, courage, and tenacity. You can think of intellectual virtues as ways of being smart that are different from whatever your natural intellectual aptitude or abilities might be. So if you feel like, in terms of natural cognitive aptitude, you're kind of middle of the road, there's, this is good news. There are other ways of being smart. And intellectual virtues like curiosity and intellectual humility and intellectual thoroughness and courage, they capture nicely these other ways of being smart that don't require being smart in the more familiar, kind of more hardwired, natural cognitive ability sense. To, to, to illustrate the difference between intellectual virtues and natural cog cognitive ability, let me quickly share with you a story of two, a tale of two logic students. I often teach symbolic logic, and it's a philosophy course that is much more like a math course 
than a regular philosophy course. We're not engaging with big questions. Instead, we're mainly doing uh, proofs in, in purely symbolic form. And it's true that some people naturally have a high aptitude for this sort of work, and some don't have a high aptitude for it naturally. And, and every time I teach the course, it's clear from the beginning which students you know, begin to sort of gravitate to one of those two extremes or the other. And a number of years ago, when I was teaching the course, I had a student named Shane and another student that I'll call Adam. Shane was one of these students for, he would have said, I'm not a math person, you know, and I'm not a logic person. Um, all this stuff in symbols is confusing and it's hard. Can't we attach words to the symbols to give some meaning? He was a very philosophical thinker, but, but he wasn't, didn't have a natural aptitude for that kind of abstract reasoning. And then Adam, by contrast, had prodigious aptitude for doing logic. So for him, in the early stages of the course, it was easy. And he stopped coming to class. And maybe on the first exam, he was still able to do reasonably well, but the more class he missed, and the harder the material got, the less capable he was at just sort of figuring it out on the fly. And so Adam ended up getting a C in the course, despite having all of this natural aptitude, because he just, again, his attendance was poor, he was lazy, and he didn't do well in the end. Shane started off with, at best, a C in the course. But his response to his own struggle, to his own early failures in the course, was to say, I'm going to get it. And so I distinctly remember him moving to the front of the course. He changed where he was going to sit in the course, sat in the front of the course, paid close attention, and incrementally over the course of the semester got better and better and better. And not only that, so not only did he just have the tenacity and courage that was required to develop the skills that were required in the course, Shane also started to make connections between um, various units and various operations that we were using in the course. So in terms of like natural ability, Shane was probably fairly middle of the road. In terms of his intellectual character, he was outstanding. That's why he succeeded in the course. That's why he's gone on to do interesting, entrepreneurial, creative, successful things since then. So there's a big difference between being smart in the, in the usual way of thinking about those things and having good intellectual character. Again, again, good intellectual character is the character of a good thinker. And intellectual virtues are the specific qualities of character required for good thinking. Here's, the, here's then the connection to how we consume information. Each intellectual virtue involves a skill or ability that can be practiced. So, for instance, we can learn and practice asking good, penetrating, rigorous, critical questions. And that kind of question asking is expressive of, characteristic of the virtue of curiosity. We can also learn to better take up alternative points of view. We can practice perspective switching, and we can get better at it. Well, perspective switching is the skill characteristic of the virtue of open-mindedness. We can practice forming judgments and drawing conclusions for ourselves. We don't just have to be pushed around intellectually by what we read. We can practice asking questions. We can practice switching perspectives. We can practice forming our own beliefs, our own conclusions. We can practice admitting what we don't know, being honest with ourselves or with others about the limitations of our knowledge. 
in doing so, we're practicing the virtue of intellectual humility. We can practice being present and alert rather than passive and asleep when we're consuming information online. In doing so, we're practicing the virtue of attentiveness. Similarly, for carefulness and thoroughness. So each of these intellectual virtues has a kind of skill or ability that we can practice and get better at. And what I'm suggesting is that we can become better, more vigilant and discriminating information gatherers by learning about and especially by practicing intellectual virtues in our thinking, in the way that we engage with information online. We don't have to be passive and indiscriminate in how we engage with information. We can practice these different virtues. And so what I'd like to do is to just leave um, both the students here and even some of the faculty that are here with a series of questions. And the reason I highlight the kind of faculty or, or teacher angle as well is that, is that here we are in, in an educational institution where it's the responsibility of, uh, and calling of the faculty to help form who you are as thinkers and learners, as information consumers. And so I think each of us as individuals in society need to think about our intellectual conduct and try to practice these virtues in, our, in, our, in the way that we engage with information online. But I think in educational contexts, we as educators need to step back and say, what, if anything, can I do to help build up and grow the intellectual character of my students? So here, first, are a few questions for um, students to think about. Um, there is a list of nine virtues with, um, with some sort of slogans next to each one, and the slogan kind of captures the skill or the ability that goes with the virtue that can be practiced. But some questions to leave you with to think about. Do I consume information passively or actively? When you're honest with yourself and you think about yourself consuming information online, are you in a passive mode or are you in an active mode? What would it look like for me to be more active, assuming that you're not already maximally active, um, what would it look like for me to be more active or active in a better way in my consumption of information? Which virtues would I need to draw on to try to practice? Finally, what obstacles might prevent me from gathering information in a more active or intellectually virtuous way? What might get in the way of you actually being a little bit more alert and discriminating in how you consume information about the world? That can be an important thing to think about uh, as well. And then for the educators in the room, which virtues do I model well for my students? And which virtues do I maybe model not so well for them? Also, do I provide my students with ongoing, well-supported opportunities to practice the virtues of good thinking? This was a question which has, that reflection on which has had a significant impact on my own teaching. Because once I asked it, I, I realized that with the way that I teach, I'm not often giving my students frequent, I'm not giving them frequent opportunities to say, ask big questions or to take intellectual risks or to admit what they don't know. So it's worth it for us as educators to say, when I think about what I do in the classroom and the, the, the readings that I assign and the assignments that I give and how I teach, how am I creating frequent opportunities and supporting students in those opportunities to practice these virtues of the mind? 
Now I realize I've just barely been able to thrown out a concept for you that I hope is relevant to what I've called the crisis of epistemic trust. Um, if, if anything is going to stick, you're probably going to need to learn a little bit more about some of these things. One option is to go to intellectualvirtues.org, and there are lots and lots of resources for you there. I thought I would also highlight um, three books. Um, the first one is written for really like this audience. The, the first book is written for, it's, 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 it's very readable, it's, it's brilliantly illustrated, um, that, that is the examples that he uses are fantastic. It's called Virtuous Mind, Virtuous Minds, Intellectual Character Development for Students, Educators, and Parents. Um, it's just a lovely, very readable introduction to intellectual virtues. If anything in what I've said about intellectual virtues kind of captures your attention, I'd highly recommend reading that book. If you want to go up one more level and read some philosophical discussions of intellectual character and intellectual virtues, I'd recommend a book uh, for you um, by Bob Roberts and Jay Wood called Intellectual Virtues, an Essay in Regulative Epistemology. And then if you have an interest, either you are an educator or you're planning to become an educator, if you have an interest in reading more about what it might look like to put some of these ideas into practice in a classroom setting, then I have a massive online 550 page, 35 chapter resource guide that you can, you can the, the, all the chapters are small and the type is big and there aren't a lot of words on every page, so don't feel overwhelmed. But if you're interested in that, um, here's an online, an online guide um, that I've written called Cultivating Good Minds, a Philosophical and Practical Guide to Educating for Intellectual Virtues. Thank you. We have time for questions. Uh, just so you guys understand how this works, this mic will be in this boom here in a moment. You don't have to wait to get in line till the first person in line leaves. You can actually make a line. That's okay, that's polite in this context. Uh, and I'm gonna make one, there's one requirement here, and that is that the first question must come from a student. The faculty cannot rescue you. Hi, um, so you talked a lot about um, learning how to be responsible in gathering information and learning how to um, interact with that information. Is there a sense, my question's kind of twofold, is there a sense in which learning is, um, somehow goes beyond the mere accumulation of information? Mm -hmm. And then with that, is learning itself an art that has maybe been lost on our culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, great question. Um, so I think my answer is yes to, to both parts of your question. And, and let me try to elaborate a little bit. That's right, I think that what, what, what often goes by learning or it's fascinating to me the way that, that people talk about I need to do some research on that you know where, where typically what that means is I need to google it and read the first few things that that, that come up and that um, that results in what a what a, what a philosopher uh, Michael Lynch refers to as google knowing right that learning gets sort of reduced to the kind of knowledge you can get by Googling something and reading through it pretty quickly, right? That's a very low bar for learning. Um, and yet, at the same time, it's a bar that we often don't even meet, right? Um, and, and, and so I think that what I'm describing as intellectual virtues they're necessary for even that lowest bar of gathering accurate information about the world. Um, but I think that they compel us to go deeper and, in fact, to search for um, deep understanding, even wisdom. And, and so my focus here has been sort of like, well, there's this polluted epistemic environment and let's get rid of some of the pollution uh, by trying to, among other things, one small part of the solution is, is I think, to improve our intellectual conduct on, online. And I think intellectual virtues help us, give us a language and a, and a way of understanding what that might look like. Um, 
But that's a very low standard, and I would say, ideally, what we'd want is something much more, much more intellectually fulfilling and deep as well. I, don't, I, I think I answered the first part of your question. I don't remember if, what the second part was and whether I actually answered it or not. Yeah, the uh, second part was just whether learning itself is oh. an art that has been lost on. Yes, I think so. I think I think learning is 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 has in many places it sort of reduced to Google knowing. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, I kind of have like two questions. So, you said one of the solutions would be like to stop Facebook or like Instagram, and I was wondering if you have social media. <laughs> I don't. I, I well, I I have a Twitter account that I was told to create back in like 2012 because of my work with these schools that w was mentioned, but I, I, I haven't ever tweeted. And I was on Facebook for a while and I just felt like I, like I just found myself um, spending more time on it than I, than I was comfortable with, so I pulled the plug a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. And then my second question is this. Is that a gotcha question? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> trying to yeah. de debate what's the best yeah. path to go, but I feel like yeah. the information gathering that you talked about is more relevant to like us and older people, but like middle school aged kids yeah. are so invested in social yeah. media. Yeah. Um, what do you think that has to do with the like virtuous citizen and mm -hmm. how they are being raised? Yeah, well, I'm I'm struck by how you know, maybe for you, at least for me, not doing social media is a viable option. I function okay in society not being on Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, but for, for younger kids, that's right. It's just, it's just part of their world and always has been. It's part of the, the air that they breathe. And so I think that, that we, I mean, I'm not an expert in technology, and so I feel like I'm not speaking as an expert here, as a philosopher, just sort of as, a, as some common sense from an ordinary citizen would be, yeah, I think we need to try to make the most of technology to use it for good and to help train our children and our students with good intellectual habits that will equip them to use that technology um, responsibly. So in some ways, it's like, yeah, there are things that maybe older people can do to, to kind of just eliminate the problem altogether. I just won't get any of my news from, from social media. Um, and, and, and maybe they have less of a need then for, for what I'm calling intellectual virtues. Um, but for the younger audiences where that, that, that's not an option, all the more reason for, um, for educators and for parents to think about what are the skills and habits that, and, and qualities of character that my students need um, in order to engage information and truth well. Yeah, so I think that's a critical part of civic education. Thank you. Uh, do you think that there's more fake news today just because there was social media? Or do you think there was just as much back in the day when there was just newspapers? You mean like, um, well, I, I, you mean like pro proportionally? Because there's just so much more information out there, right? And so many more, so much more media out there. And therefore, there's more fake news. Um, but I do understand, I'm not an expert in fake news either. Um, but, I, but it's not like it's a, an entirely new phenomenon. There has always been fake news. But I do think that both proportionally and in terms of overall volume that there is more. And I think that's pretty well documented. And I think it's easy to explain why. It's this combination of how easy it is to disseminate information and then the mechanisms and the, tech, the technological advances that are used um, in the development and, and, and dissemination of that information just make fake news so easy. And, and a lot of it is, it, there, there's a big, it's not, I mean, my understanding is most fake news isn't actually political, the creation of it isn't actually politically driven. The spreading of it may be politically driven, but the creation of it is actually just, uh, it's, a, it's a monetary incentive. 
So people, it's about getting, you get paid for clicks, right? And so if what will um, get people's attention the most, and if what people will spread the most happens to be fake news, then people are gonna create fake news. So there's a, there's a market and a monetization to fake news that I suspect is, is probably somewhat unique. But wasn't it like back in the day, didn't you get paid to sell the newspapers? So like, wouldn't you wanna put up kinda? Of sure, and there's like always that? been bad journalism and, and yellow journalism and so forth. Um, but I think you don't, you don't have the, you didn't have the technological sophistication, right, that you, that, that you have today. And again, it's just the, the proliferation of it. I think that's problematic. Not to mention, and this is related to the proliferation, but not to, not to mention that the problem of trust, right? Like even then it was clearer. Even when I was growing up, it was like, oh yeah, there's the National Enquirer. Sure, that's fun, for, that's fun to read and interesting to look at, but, but that's not serious information. Today, where's the serious information? It's not like there's not widespread agreement about where you, if you really want the truth about politics or science or history, where you look, there's just much less agreement about that, and I think that's a function of some of the things that we talked about. Thank you. Thank you. So you said this like Google searching knowledge where we just like Google the first few things is not a good thing, it's bad. But what if you just want to get like a basic understanding of something? Yeah. Is that okay? Sure. I don't think it's bad without, without qualification. So absolutely. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Google is amazing that we can get. It. Sometimes all we need is bits of information, right? Mm -hmm. But if we, if we reduce learning and education to that type of learning or information acquisition, that's what's problematic. So no, I mean, Google is wonderful. And I think often all we need is information, basic information. We don't need deep understanding. The problem is if our intellectual lives and our lives as learners and thinkers gets reduced to that type of knowing, I think that's where it's problematic. So, so long as we don't use it for just um, all of our deep knowledge and we can just use it for yeah. general, it's okay. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Thank you to all the students who've come up and asked yeah, questions. I really appreciate that. Thank you.